Hi, my name is Bree, and I have the privilege of serving as Chief of Staff here at Transformation Church. At TC, our vision is to represent God to the lost and found for transformation in Christ. And we just want to say thank you so much for tuning in from wherever you're watching from. If you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. We believe that God has a word just for you. So let's jump into today's message. Why don't you stay on your feet this morning? Is it still morning? I don't know what we call it. Listen, uh, I could introduce myself, but I just, I, I'd rather just tell you this morning that I have come on assignment. What you need to know not about me is not what I've done or where I've been. You just need to know that is that I'm not supposed to be alive. And they told my mom to go home and stop wasting her time staying overnight, just torturing herself being at the hospital because I wouldn't survive through the night. They wanted her to go home and plan my funeral and begin grieving over me, but she said, I believe God for a miracle. And when I lived, they told her that I would either not speak, think, or be able to walk. I would be so severely mentally handicapped that if I lived, that, that I, they would wish that I died. But I came today because the miracle working power of Jesus Christ and the plan of God was greater for my life. So they said it wouldn't walk. So I used my feet to stomp on devils. And then I said I wouldn't speak. So I used my words to cut through atmospheres. And today I have come and I want to tell you the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me today to set at liberty those who are captive. And if you walk in here bound, you can leave free today in Jesus' name. Do you need a miracle today? I want to pray for you before I even say the word. This word has nothing to do with miracles. But when you are a miracle and you have the faith to believe, I believe in a moment like this that God could do anything. And so right now I'm praying in Jesus' mighty name. I command every cancer to shrivel up and die in this place and under the sound of my voice across the waves. Right now, I command every barren womb to be open in the name of Jesus, and I call forth life. If you did it for me, my God, you can do it for anyone. I thank you, God, that today marriages are being restored, that people who are so stuck in their past are going to be set free today once and for all. I thank you, God, for miracle signs and wonders to confirm your word, and we bow in our hearts hearts before you and we thank you for the beautiful privilege of sitting beneath your word. You're beautiful. You're everything. We honor you, Jesus, and we lean into you today. We ask, would you speak, Lord? And we promise that we will listen in Jesus' name. If you believe it, could you shout amen? Amen. 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 Give Jesus a hand of praise. Woo. Y'all can blame that on Pastor Charles. He came up here running, everything. You may be seated. I'm so glad to be here. Um, my name is Katie Kazadi. I want to um, thank you so much for having me. I want to honor your pastors. They're not in the building, but uh, Pastors Mike and Natalie Todd, my goodness. Can we honor them? Things, these kind of places are not just built off of just talent. They're built on your knees, and they are sustained on your face. And so I'm, I'm thankful for people, your senior pastors, down to your executive leadership, who are people of prayer and intercession. And the reason this place is still moving forward is because they live on their face before God. And I'm thankful for that. I honor you guys, Pastor Charles, Pastor Bree, Pastor Amberly's not here, but I'm just so honored to be on the team today. Can I just call you team, home team? Is that all right? Can I just be home? All right, cool. So today we're going to go um, to the Word. Is my mic, do I need to make an adjustment? Are we good? Okay, I thought I heard a little click. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, we're all good then. So this morning, um, I'm going to go to the Word. I just need you to know right now that I am a Bible teacher, which means I don't have a bag to stay in. I stay out of my bag and I stay in my book, okay? So we're going to go to the Word today <laughs> because I've discovered that, the, that the book, my book is the bag, right? This actually, it doesn't need any help and it doesn't need any tricks. So we're going to go in and we're going to go deep. And I believe that um, 
you're going to go home touched by the message, but also so hungry for the Word of God. That is what I believe. You're going to go home and open this Bible and be like, is this really in here? Because I've been missing out on this. So this morning, um, we're going to spend most of the morning walking through a story in Scripture. Uh, it's one of my favorites. And honestly, it's the stuff that movies are made of. I love this story. In the Old Testament, it's got a little bit of everything, okay? So it's got drama. It's got, um, okay, it's got some romance. It's got some comedy, if you look for it. It's got lots of action, um, some blood and everything for us. So it's got something for everybody. I'm going to walk us through this, and we're going to pause here and there, and we're going to process it, okay? We're going to talk through what it is. So allow me, before I get into it, to take about 60 seconds just to nerd out. Is that all right? I want to prepare you so that you have a good understanding um, of what we're really doing here. So there's different types of literature in the Bible, right? You understand that, right? So um, some of these books are called historical narratives. So what I'm going to read out today is a historical narrative, which means this. This is a narrative, so it's narrated by the author, and it's historical. This is facts. This is not um, a poem. This is not just something fun to read. This is literally written to be read, and so you can understand your history as a believer, where you came from, who came before you, and how Jesus was hiding in the Old Testament before you see him in the New Testament. So when you read the Bible, the easiest thing to do is look to characters in the story and try to identify with them, right? But I want to encourage you, if you really want to understand the scripture, to when you look at these stories, to stop trying to learn from the character, but ask yourself, what is the story telling me about the character of God? Because anytime you meet a character in scripture, that character is only there to introduce you to the character of God. What do I see about God here in this text that I don't find anywhere else? And this is how we learn and come to know God, who he is, and how he gets down. I'm going to tell you in advance, I'm going to speak from this text in three different ways, okay? First, literally, which means I'm going to tell you exactly, literally, what it meant for the original hearers. This is a historical, we're going to just talk about what it really was, literally. Okay, why it was written. And then I'm going to talk figuratively. I'm going to tell you that in advance so that you know when I say it, when I start to see the metaphor in it and it points to a greater truth in the scripture, I want you to know that I'm not trying to say that this is the deeper meaning of what this story really means. What I'm trying to tell you is that when I read this story, it reminds me of all the greater truth that I find that is a mirror to it that aligns in scripture. So I'm going to go literally, figuratively, and prophetically. I'm going to speak literally, figuratively, and figuratively, and prophetically in the sense that I believe the Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth, not past tense, that is now coming from the mouth of God, which means God can take this message and divide it a thousand ways, and it'll hit its target in every single heart. It means that God knows exactly where you are, and he will find you right now. And his word is so sharp, when it gets in, it sticks in. And when you pull it out, things come out with it that never belonged there in the first place. So the word of God is going to go forth, and today I want to speak to you from the title, A Holy Divorce. A Holy Divorce. Now before we jump into the uh, story for Samuel... I'm just thankful to be here because the beautiful, wonderful team of hospitality filled my room with balloons. This morning, early this morning, one of those balloons popped. And I'm from New York. And so I was like, am I hit? Am I hit? What? And so I'm just, I'm so thankful to be alive this morning. I'm so thankful just to be here. Um, but I want to introduce you to the first character in the story. Allow me to reintroduce you to a guy you're familiar with named David in Scripture. He's going to be uh, one of our main characters. You know David, the guy who went from this, you know, shepherd boy, watching sheep, and he ends up king because, king Sam, I mean, because Samuel the prophet comes and anoints him king, but there's a long time in between. That's to David. Now, at this point, it's been years since, um, since he was anointed, and aside from killing Goliath, his life has been pretty crazy for all the wrong reasons. God calls him, anoints him, but all he's been doing is ducking spears and trying to run for his life. He's like, ain't nobody even asked for this. I didn't ask to be king. What, what are we doing here? So his life has been terrible. He was anointed for reigning, but all he's been doing is running. And so here, 
Here he is, and、um, the only ally he really has, his main ally, is Samuel. Samuel's the prophet. He is well respected. He is the Billy Graham of his nation. Like nobody got nothing bad to say about Billy Graham. I wish you would say something about Billy Graham. So Samuel is is the one in all of Israel that everyone knows is God's man. He has been the prophet and the leader in many ways. He's the one God used to anoint Saul as king, even though. God didn't want a king. He was the one when the people wanted a king. He said, "All right, I'll give you a, a king. You want a king? Here's a king." Samuel has become David's ally, along with about 600 renegade, crazy boys who are his soldiers, his rider dies. They're like, "All right, David, whatever, whatever you do, we got you. We're with you." He got some renegades, some outlaws, and he's got Samuel. Every time he starts to question. Or needs encouragement or prayer, he can always run to Samuel. Now, in the chapter right before the one we're going to read, because I want to give you context, in the chapter right before, King Saul, who has been years now trying to kill David for doing nothing at all, but he can sense that God has anointed him, so he's been chasing him down. David has spent years running from Saul. Saul has been fearlessly trying to kill him. You know, it's bad when like the president of the United States is, doesn't just send the military. He's like, I'm gonna come with you. Saul is going with the armies everywhere, which means he either intends to kill David himself or wants to watch him die. Either way, this is the kind of dude you're dealing with. Okay, this is Saul trying to kill him, and now David has his chance. He's on the run, and they find Saul. You can't make this up. He says he's relieving himself in a cave. Okay, Saul's relieving himself in a cave. That's what it says. And David's boys are like, "Now's your chance. Let's take this guy out." And and he's got the perfect opportunity, and he's like debating it. And instead, he goes and he sneaks up behind him. He must have drank a lot of water because I feel like this takes a long time. He cut <laughs> he cut a piece of his garment off and snuck away, and then ended up going. Saul, I could have killed you, but I didn't. And then. He is so grieved by the fact that he just cut this dude's clothes that he's like, I can't believe I almost, I almost hurt the man of God. I couldn't be David, because if I'm David, you've been trying to kill me. I got 536 excuses for putting a shank in you right here and saying to God be the glory. Now I say that not to say that I would be right, but to say. That this is the kind of holy restraint we see David operating in. I mean, he could, and maybe he should, but he is able to restrain himself and say, "How dare I touch the man God has anointed king?" That's the David that we're dealing with. And then suddenly, a very long saga in First Samuel of, of Saul chasing David, trying to kill him. This whole back and forth is just interrupted with one verse that changes everything. The first verse of Samuel, First Samuel 25, just says, "Now Samuel died, and all of Israel gathered for his funeral. They buried him at his house in Ramah, and then David moved down to the wilderness of Maon." Okay, so I'm not going to preach to you today about the death of Samuel, but I feel like I need to submit it to you as evidence for David's state of mind. Okay, because what we're going to get about to read about David will get confusing if you don't have context for where he is. Okay, so. It says Samuel has just died. We need to know what David are we dealing with. You know, have you ever had someone just come up to you, you don't recognize them one bit, and they're like, "Hey, I remember you," and you do the slowest blink. You're like, "What me do you remember? I don't. I need to know. Is it 2010 me, or is it 2018 me? There's a big difference. I don't recognize you. Which me do you know? Not you. Maybe me. So." If you meet me when I'm grieving a miscarriage and I'm weeping over a toilet like it's a coffin, that's one me. Did you meet me then, or did you meet me in a car parked outside a fertility expert, where they just punched me in the gut and told me that I would never give birth to children and there was nothing that could be done? Did you meet me then? Did you meet me crying over that toilet, or did you meet me on the other side of the mess? When God touched me, opened up my womb, and I cried over the children that He gave me as a miracle, which me did you meet? Because, 
the way I behaved in the middle of my mess is not the same way I behaved in the middle of my miracle. I wish I could say it was. But we need to understand that when we approach people, even in Scripture, and we need to understand who we're meeting and what their context is so we can understand where they are. And David is about to act in a way in the middle of his mess that is not the same as he acted in the cave. Which David are we dealing with? And I want to explain to you why. What does this have to do with Samuel's death? And I'll tell you why. Because after all these years of fighting to survive and fighting to believe that Samuel was right, that God has called you? Do you understand that Samuel was the only one on this earth who could really testify that God had chosen to bypass the system, reach into a shepherd field, and pick a little dirty boy to be king? Samuel was the only one. This is not famous Samuel to him. He's famous Samuel to everybody else, but to David, this is personal. He's out in the wilderness, and he gets news that Samuel is died. This is the man who looked at me when my own father saw nothing in me, and he saw God's mark on my heart. This is the one person who looked past my appearance and saw God's hand and God's calling. This is the only person that I have been able to go to for protection from Saul. This is where I've been able to go for encouragement and prayer. And when I feel like, are you sure this is going to happen? God, Samuel is the one person that can still look me in my eyes and say, God said it and he'll complete it. But now God has taken Samuel. And on top of losing him, he can't even go to the funeral. It says the whole nation gathers to mourn, but David moves 100 miles south further into the wilderness. He cannot go back for closure. He cannot go back for final respects because if he does, now Saul will kill him even more. So he can't get closure. And now he's even more vulnerable to Saul because Samuel pretty much has been the only thing standing between Saul killing David. So now he's grieving and he's vulnerable and when he, anytime you're grieving, human nature is you start to remember the interactions you've had with the person. And I believe David is now in a wilderness and he can close his eyes. And just as real as if it was happening yesterday, he can feel the oil running down his face. And he can hear the whisper of Samuel saying, son, God sees something nobody else does. God has chosen you. Don't tell anyone why I'm anointing you, but you're going to be king. And he could remember it, and he can still smell the scent of jealousy in the room. It is as real to him as it was then. But what do you do when the oil has dried? And the witness is dead, and you're left wondering, did God's plan for my life die with Samuel? Was all this for nothing? It is in this condition that we find David. This is the David that we are about to encounter, a desperate David. And now the story will slow down. And whenever a narrator slows down, they are screaming at you to pay attention. And so we are going to pay attention, and we're going to turn the movie on. Somebody with a remote out there, press play. Can somebody? 1 Samuel 25. There was a wealthy man from Aon who owned property near the town of Carmel. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, which means he was loaded. And it was sheep shearing time, which also means payday, just so you know. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. When David heard that Nabal was shearing his sheep, he sent ten of his young men to Carmel with this message from Nabal. Peace and prosperity to you, your family, and everything you own. I'm told that it's sheep shearing time. And while your shepherds stayed among us near Carmel, we never harmed them, and nothing was ever stolen for them. Ask your own men, and they'll tell you it's true. So would you be so kind to us since we have come at a time of celebration? Please share any provisions you might have on hand with us and your friend, or the, the actual word he uses here is son, your son, David. David's young men gave this message to Nabal in David's name, and they waited for reply. They were not ready. Who is this fellow David, Nabal smeared, sneered to the young men. Who does this son of Jesse think he is? There are lots of servants these days who run away from their masters. Should I take my bread, my water, my meat? 
and my meat that I've slaughtered for my shearers and give it to a band of outlaws who come from who knows where? So David's young men returned and told him what Nabal had said. They said nothing. They just turned around and went, get your swords, was David's reply as he strapped on his own. Then 400 men started off with David and 200 remained behind to guard their equipment. Pause. We got to pause. Okay. Can we pause and process? So David and his 400 men are grieving. They are out seeking refuge in this, in the wilderness, in the, in the territory of this guy named Nabal. The narrator introduces us to Nabal. He is an excessively wealthy man. He's powerful, but he's also evil and mean. And his name is Nabal. He's married to what the scripture describes as a beautiful and intelligent woman named Abigail. So what happened back then in these cultures is, it's weird to us in our culture, but it wasn't then. You would kind of do a service for someone and then ask them for pay later. It's kind of like back in the day when people used to kind of sometimes at a stoplight come up and wash your window without you asking. Like, no, no, I don't, no, okay. Okay, I don't have, ca- does anybody have cash? <laughs> like you, it's worse than when you started. I didn't ask you to do that, right? But this was actually... <laughs> This was actually quite normal back then, and so they were watching out for them and doing a service and then coming back and saying, hey, would you just, and they're not asking for nothing crazy, would you feed us? Because they're actually hungry. Well, David sends his men to ask, and Nabal completely disrespects him. He doesn't just say no. What he's about to do is not the equivalent of you telling the guy, sorry, man, I don't have cash. It's the equivalent of you rolling down the window and spitting in his face. He says this, Nabal's response is, David who? Who is this son of Jesse? And his second question lets us know that he already knows the answer to the first. He actually knows, and his whole point right now is to disrespect him in front of his men. He is saying to him, I'm here to insult you because I'm on Saul's side. You're not the son of a king. You're the son of Jesse, and shepherds can't be kings. In other words, you're not who God says you are. You are where you came from. Well, Nabal picked the wrong time (laughs) to question whether or not David was going to be who God said he would be. He didn't know, but he picked the wrong time to question what God said. Now David is triggered. He's grieving and he's tired of fighting for a calling he didn't even ask for. He's like, all I did is say yes. So now the voice of one man is magnified and it sounds in his ear like the voice of the whole world saying, you'll never be what God has said. And so now you can understand why his response is not a strategy. It's just strap up. He's like, I asked nicely. In fact, I even called your, I even called myself your son, but now I'm going to tell you who your daddy is. And you're about to learn today. I asked nicely. He's like, oh, you think because you're rich and privileged that you can, you can sit in my face and disrespect me? You think that because you come from here that you're going to tell me what can happen or what can happen about my life? Watch what happens. Watch how big you talk when I come there with all my boys, 400 of us all strapped up. He is triggered and he is desperate. And this isn't even about Nabal. He wants to send a message to everyone. Like when everyone hears about this, I wish somebody would call me the son of Jesse again. I wish a Nabal would. I wish a Nabal would try to come and tell me. I wish a Nabal would try to tell me that what God said about me will not come to pass. I wish a Nabal would hear about this and ever come confront me again. The spirit of the living God says otherwise. I wish you would. I promise you this. Ain't nobody calling me the son of Jesse ever again when they hear about this. Now that same David who just had all that holy restraint. Now him, his 400 men are on the war path ready to massacre. And you can hear them and their animals. And this is the sound of a righteous anger on an unrighteous path. He is now about to throw everything away because if God would not co-sign him killing Saul, he sure is not going to turn his head on him massacring an entire family. Unpause. Meanwhile, 
one of Nabal's servants went to Abigail and told her, David sent messages from the wilderness to greet our master, but he screamed insults at them. These men have been very good to us. We never suffered no harm from them. Nothing was stolen from us. He's like, he's frantic. Nothing was stolen from us the whole time they were with us. In fact, day and night, they were like a wall of protection to us and the sheep. You need to know this and figure out what to do. For there's going to be trouble for our master and his whole family. He's so ill-tempered that no one can even talk to him. Abigail wasted no time. She quickly gathered 200 loaves of bread, two wineskins full of wine, five sheep that had been slaughtered. How do you do this quickly? How is it quickly and 200 loaves? I just <laughs> slaughtered. Nearly a bushel of roasted green, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 fig cakes. My girl. She packed them on donkeys and said to her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you shortly. But she did not tell her, her husband Nabal what she was doing. Pause. So the servant finds out, and he goes to Nabal's wife. He's like, listen, your crazy husband. This is what he just did. And you notice she's not, she doesn't even defend him or be like, really? He, he, what, what he really? She's like, mm-hmm, keep going. What? She's not surprised at all. This is just the kind of person he is. So, she, so they're like, listen, he's coming with his people, and they're going to kill everybody. And without even consulting Nabal, she quickly takes action. She devises a strategy. She prepares a massive offering and quickly sets out. She's decided that she is going to mediate. She's going to be, she's going to be the one that goes and stands between David and Nabal. So now before I even get to the action about what happens when a wealthy housewife faces off with 400 men on the warpath at the height of rage and anger, I have to stop because before I was a preacher, I was a writer and I just, I'm a little bit stuck at the introductions because the, the writer puts the, the introductions of Nabal and Abigail so far at the beginning before they're introduced, I almost forgot what he said. If you remember in the beginning, he uses very strong language. He calls Nabal, he, he, he tells us that Nabal means fool. Nabal literally means fool. His mama knew. It says he was rich and surly and evil and mean. This is very strong language. And it says it even, uh, he later is called the son of Belial, which later becomes a formal name for Satan. So he's the son of the devil. It's pretty obvious. Married to Abigail. And it says Abigail means the father or cause of joy. And it says she was beautiful and intelligent. So first of all, I'm confused. I've got questions. <laughs> okay, I've got questions. Maybe it's just me. I don't mean to be judgy. Um, but I'm like, they use such strong descriptive language for the two of them, but it couldn't be more opposite. So I'm like, first of all, how'd y'all, how'd y'all get together? Have you ever met somebody and she's like totally beautiful and then her husband walks up and he's like tore up from the floor up and his breath stinks and everything and you're like, and then you're immediately like, oh, he's rich. You know how you judge. You know how you do. So I'm looking at that like, but the Bible just told me that you're so intelligent, but I'm sorry, but like, if you're so smart, how did you make such a stupid decision? I think that this introduction is not misplaced, perhaps, the Holy Spirit, knowing how we are wired, he sets us up in advance for the story by letting us know beforehand so that when we meet her, we don't assume that she is as stupid as the decisions that she's made. The text is telling us here that what a person, that where a person is does not define who they are. It is possible for a person to have a whole lot of brains, a whole lot of gifting, a whole lot of anointing, and also a whole lot of regrets. Have you ever made a bad decision? Some of y'all like, yeah, I wore Jordans in the rain one time. It was terrible. <laughs> Noted. But I'm talking about the kind of decision that is derailing. 
Maybe somebody out there, you can't even say amen. Have you ever made a, a, a decision that is so debilitating? You know, it's the thing that the enemy hangs over your head to taunt you into not pursuing God's call on your life. And he threatens that if you do, that he will expose you or that it will define you and everyone will find out that kind of foolish decision. See, I came today to talk to some male and female Abigail, some folks with a navel who have found themselves married to a bad decision. Have you ever had a conversation with yourself? Not regular talking to yourself like we all do, but the kind where you get done and you hear a message or a podcast and you look in the mirror and you're like, you know what? Bro, you can do anything. You got to go after God's call. You need to step out in faith. This is the time. You, and you're just so inspired. And then there's this other voice and saying, yeah, no, 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 no. That's what you could have been if it were not from here. But because of this, you have disqualified yourself. I'm talking about some feelings in your past that you feel like you are tied to for all of time. Something that misrepresents who, re who you really are, but shapes how you see the future. Something behind you that you believe could cost you what's in front of you. I came to talk to some people today who are married to their past. In the sense that you have made a silent vow and you have said, Till death do us part, that's how long you'll be with me. See, shortly after introducing us to her bad decision, the, the scripture then puts on display for 30 verses the brilliance, the intelligence, the spirituality, and the courage of Abigail, reminding us and making us so aware that she is not Nabal, that Nabal got her in this position, but that is not who she is. I came to tell you today, the, whole, the same thing the Holy Spirit is showing us here, that you are not Nabal, that you are not your past. And if we're going to faithfully handle this story, we have to also self ask ourselves another question, that's this, is was Nabal really her choice at all? In a time of arranged marriages, how much input did she really have? All the pressure culturally, because I'm sure Nabal didn't become a fool overnight. Maybe her dad was more concerned with his wealth and her well-being. So perhaps Nabal wasn't really her choice, but like many of you, Nabal was the direct result of being failed by the very people who were, her, who were supposed to protect her. Maybe the one she stuck with, the, the past that she stuck with, isn't even her own fault. Maybe, maybe, or maybe she saw Nabal and daddy was like, yo, I don't think he's the one girl, Abby. Please, no, he's, he's mean. And she saw all the money and said, daddy, but I can change him. And I, and I think that he's got more inside of him. And I see some, and maybe she, she talked her, her, her dad into choosing him. Who knows? But the reality is we could ask ourselves day and night, how did she get here? And we would never really know, much like you could lay in bed every night asking yourself, how did I get here? And not ever really know how how did I get here? Waking up in strange hotel rooms saying, how did I get here? White powder covering your nose, but how did I get here? Maybe in the house of your dreams, but there's a suicide note tucked in the bedside drawer and you're asking, how did I get here? Night sweats, dreams haunted with memories of your worst indiscretions. And even though it was so long ago, the memories won't die. And it's like waking up in the bed with Nabel every day and thinking forever until death do us part. I have to share this bed with you. How did I get here? I want to tell you, you may never be able to answer that question, but I have a better one, and that is this. Do you want to die there? I don't know how you got there, but do you want to die there? The servant comes, and he tells, he tells her what's going on, and maybe her initial thought was, you know what? Like, I'm so tired of living with this guy. Like, let just, just take me to heaven now. Let them just come kill us all. She can't change what's behind her, but she has enough faith to believe that she can intervene. And for what comes ahead, she has enough faith to believe that even though there's some foolishness in my past, if I take a step out in faith, I might be able to salvage my future. So we are watching here and we are finding out what does it take for someone who has made some really bad decisions to still be used mightily by God to shake off their past in order to salvage their future. 
So we walk back into the story, we find her now, the real housewife of my own, headed straight in the direction of Trigger David and his 400 warriors who are hungry for blood, unpause. <laughs> And as she's riding a donkey into Mountain Ravine, she saw David and his men coming toward her. David had just been saying, a lot of good it did to help this fellow. We protected his flocks in the wilderness. Nothing he owned was stolen, but he's repaid me evil for good. May God strike me and kill me if even one man of his household is still alive tomorrow morning. He's riding along saying this. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed low before him. She fell at his feet and said, I accept all blame in this matter, my lord. Please listen to what I have to say. I, I know Nabal is wicked and ill-tempered man. Please don't pay any attention to him. He is a fool, just as his name suggests. My girl. <laughs> Can't make it up. But I even... But I never even saw the young men you sent. Now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, since the Lord has kept you from murdering and taking vengeance into your own hands, let all your enemies and those who try to harm you be as cursed as Nabal is. And here is a present that I, your servant, have brought to you and your young men. Please forgive me if I've offended you in any way. The Lord will surely reward you with a lasting dynasty. She's coming in hot, y'all. For you are fighting the Lord's battles, and you have not done wrong through your entire life. Even when you are chased by those who seek to kill you, your life is safe in the care of the Lord your God, secure in his treasure pouch. But the lives of your enemies will disappear like stones shot from a sling. I see your play on words. You know he killed that. Okay. Girl working. When the Lord has done all he promised and has made you leader of Israel, don't let this be a blemish on your record. Then your conscience won't have to bear the staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. And when the Lord has done these great things for you, please remember me, your servant. David replied to Abigail, praise the Lord, the God of Israel. <laughs> I wish someone would greet me like that one day. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you to meet me today. Thank God for your good sense. Bless you for keeping me from murder and from carrying out vengeance with my own hands. For I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept me from hurting you, that if you had not hurried out to meet me, not one of Nabal's men would still be alive tomorrow morning. Then David accepted her present and told her, go home in peace. I have heard what you said. We will not kill your husband. She's like, well, maybe just that one. You should just... Uh, a pause. What does it take for someone who has some really bad decisions to still be used mightily by God? One of the first things I see was that what she does here looks so foolish, but it's not foolish, it's just fearless. And the fear of looking foolish is what will actually keep you stuck where you are, how many opportunities have you run away from because your past mistake left you afraid of looking foolish again? This is what the enemy does. You make a bad decision. He uses that one decision to paralyze you from making any other decisions because you just don't trust your decision-making ability anymore. So you stand at the bus stop of life. You say, I don't know when to get on. And baby, you think that you're not making a decision, but indecision is a decision because the bus is leaving and you have just been paralyzed by your fear of looking foolish. And if the enemy can't get you to doubt your decision-making ability, if he can, then he'll get you to stop doing anything at all. I know you made some bad decisions, but you separate yourself from bad decisions by making one good decision at a time. You have to decide to move forward and decide, do you want to be safe or do you want to be free? Do you want to be safe or do you want to be free? I noticed this too. She could have blamed Nabal or she could have blamed her father. She could have blamed everybody else, but she takes full responsibility. She doesn't. She says, this is on me because I married him. We became one. And so I take full responsibility. She quickly dismounts her donkey and bows at his feet. This is dismounting in the presence of a superior is the highest token of respect in this day. And she's a woman of great esteem, but she humbles herself even in front of her servants. This ain't a king. This is an outlaw. He's a wanted traitor. She, she dismounts and she gets on her face and she lies prostrate before 
him how do you atone for Nabal? Not by running and hiding, not by sitting and soaking, but by, and not by deciding that your best days are behind you, but by fearlessly moving forward toward the future and moving there on your face. In fact, I came to tell you, you ought to thank your Nabal because it's your Nabal that will keep you on your face in the very posture that God needs to be able to lift you up. And that's why God loves to use people with a Nabal because it keeps you humble. Without a Nabal, you would think that you have accomplished it all on your own. But when you're like me and you've got a Nabal, you think I'm standing on this stage, but I am flat on my face. And God can trust me with this mic because I know who I am. I know where he's brought me from and I am not confused about how I got here if you humble yourself before the Lord he shall lift you up and did your he did your neighbor humiliate you or did he humble you and I'll tell you how you can tell because if he just humiliated you you'll be desperate to get your reputation back but if he humbled you you'll just want your heart back Your Nabal keeps you low enough to encounter grace. She brings a massive offering, which reminds me that even though bad decisions have a consequence and a price, that price does not have to cost you your future. And now don't miss this part. She flips the switch and she becomes prophetic. Now remember the David we're dealing with. Remember David is questioning. He's triggered because now he's questioning if God will truly make him king now that Samuel is dead. And then she starts to say like, stuff to him like, when the Lord has done all he promised and made you leader of Israel, don't let this blemish be on your record. And she starts to remind him of who God has called him to be. See, Abigail does not just see someone who could destroy her whole family. She sees someone who's about to make a decision that could cost him everything. And nobody is more qualified to keep David from making a bad decision than Abigail. So she does what maybe she wished someone would have done for her. And she looks David in his eyes and she starts to remind David of how much a decision can cost you. David, look me, look me in the eyes, David. It's not worth it. God has called you. You're a warrior. You're not a killer, David. God has called you to be a king. Trust me, there are decisions that define you, David. Don't let this be a blemish. Don't bear the staggering burden of regret. And right now, you you have every right to be angry. Did you ever stop to think that maybe the thing you think disqualifies you actually qualifies you to save someone from what you've suffered? And he goes, praise God who sent you to me. In other words, disaster didn't send you, God sent you. And I love a good ending. She goes, okay, you're pardoned. Go ahead and go home. I love a good ending. But then I asked myself, what good is it to survive Nabal, but still have to live with him till death do us part? David forgave, but what good is it to be forgiven, but not free? Unpause. When Abigail arrived home, she found that Nabal was throwing a big party and was celebrating like a king. He was super drunk. So she didn't tell him anything about her meeting with David until dawn the next day. And in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife told him what had happened. And as a result, he had a stroke and he lay paralyzed on his bed like a stone. And about 10 days later, the Lord struck him and he died. Now that's the kind of ending I'm talking about. That fool died. I don't know if I'm allowed to clap, but I'm happy. We heard David say that God used Abigail to save him from what he would regret. But I want to ask you this. What if this whole scenario isn't about God rescuing David from something he will regret, but about God rescuing Abigail from what she already regrets? You say, would God really orchestrate all of that to set one person free from her own mistakes? You would be shocked at what God would do to set you free. And God decided that while she was satisfied with going home pardoned, that he wouldn't stop until she was free. And I want to tell you, this is what you call a holy divorce. 
It is a holy divorce where the thing you ought to be tied to for the rest of your life is struck by God when God supernaturally severs you from the shame you've answered to, from the name you have answered to, and by his blood, he breaks the vow you have made with your past and releases you into a future. See, a natural divorce requires two signatures, and Nabal will never sign. I'm telling you right now, your past will never sign. He will never release you willingly, but a holy divorce only requires one signature and it must be signed in blood and I'm sorry to tell you your blood won't work your works won't work you can't earn it you can't deserve it it is signed in blood it is a holy divorce when Nabal dies love a good ending but it's not over on pause when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise the Lord who has avenged the insult I received from Nabal and has kept me from doing it myself. Nabal has received the punishment for his sin. Then David sent messengers to Abigail to ask her to become his wife. Verse 42, quickly getting ready, she took along five of her servant girls' attendants and went with David's messengers, and so she became his wife. Listen, Abigail was not just saved from Nabal, she was saved for David. Because you cannot be married to your past and your future. She didn't have to say yes, so here's the interesting thing to me when they come and they say David wants to know she could have stayed in familiarity and stayed there and said, you know what? It's so nice of him to offer, but I'm just going to stay here because I know how to live here. It's comfortable here. Here I have everything Nabal left behind. I don't have him, so I should just stay here. She could have thought, you know what, I'm just glad to be free, but David's going to be king, and I don't deserve to be a queen. I won't know how to live there, so I'll rather stay here. And if the enemy can't keep your Nabal alive, he will just settle with you settling here, feeling unqualified to live there. I want to tell you right now, you could try as hard as you want your whole life, but you cannot atone for your navel. What's behind you, you cannot atone for. In fact, Jesus already did. And so when Abigail comes to David, she is actually a type of Christ. She is the innocent coming to stand in place of the guilty. She is standing between wrath and sin. She comes and humbles herself like Jesus, though he was God. He humbled himself and he became a little lower than angels. Therefore, God has exalted him and given him the name above every name. She humbles herself. She even comes riding on a donkey as Jesus did. Abigail, my friend, is a type of Christ. She is a foreshadowing, letting us know that no matter what you have behind you, you cannot atone for it. And in fact, every time you try, you are slapping God in the face and saying that the finished work of the cross is an unfinished work and that you need to add to it. And I came by the power of the Holy Spirit to tell you this is a holy divorce. For every indiscretion, there is blood. Let me tell you this about the grace of God. Let me show you the grace of God displayed in the life of Abigail. We find that while she's married to Nabal, she is seemingly barren, never has any kids, even though in that time, that's your number one job, barefoot and pregnant. That's why you're here. Which means it seems that she has no, since she has no children from Nabal, it would seem that she is barren. Yet we fast forward a bit and we find that when she marries David, she gives birth to a son. Which tells me the grace of God is that even though there is a consequence of having a Nabal, she had to live with him for a long time. But the grace of God was that he never allowed her to give birth to his children. So she would not have to carry pieces of her past into her future. God said, I will make you, take you to a new place and make you look in the face of Nabal every day and be reminded of everything you've done wrong. I won't let you have a fruitful life right now because that fruit will just remind you of your failures. And so I'm shutting your womb now. But when you get to the other side of this promise, you're going to be able to. It is the grace of God. 
When he died, before she could marry David, she had to bury Nabal. Before you marry, you got to bury. Some of you have kept Nabal on life support. It's a form of self-punishment. Because you feel like you need to still have to have a consequence and look at him and you have kept him alive yourself. You relive it. You retell it. You have kept him on life support. But I came to tell you in the name of Jesus that it's time to pull the blood, the plug. You got to bury that fool. You got to bury that fool. You got to bury Nabal in order to marry David. You need to bury it. Now listen, this is the part that I love. Okay. How this all happened, I go back and I go, wait, how did he die again? Because that's my favorite part. I want to see, wait, how'd that happen again? She goes home. And here's the interesting thing to me is that as we close right now, this is, this is, this is how we're going home. The interesting thing to me is that when she went home and was spared, she never needed to tell Nabal anything. I would have just laid there and been like, oh, you don't even know what happened last night, but I'm not going to bother tell you because you're so mean. I don't know what you're going to do. You're going to be upset. But at some point, she got home. I think she relived all night what just had happened and was like, I can't believe all that just happened. I'm so glad I brought bread because I think they would have killed me if they were also hungry on top of angry. And I can't believe. And she's just reliving the whole thing. And then she's looking at Nabal all night. And he wakes up and he's sobered up. And she makes a decision. I don't know if I would have made. She, she makes a decision to tell the story. And when she told the story, he had a stroke. And when he had a stroke, 10 days later, God struck him. So she told the story. And it says when she told the story, as a result, he had a stroke. And then God struck. So she told the story, I'm trying to relive this, she told the story, then he had a stroke, and then God struck. So what if she retraces our step and she doesn't tell the story? Does he have a stroke? And does God strike? What if this, did he really die from a stroke? Or did God kill him with a story? Did God kill him with a story? Because I read, because I see a picture here, I, I see a picture here. Revelation chapter 12, then I, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Messiah for the accusers of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down and they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb that's the divorce papers and the word of their testimony they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony the blood is the part jesus does the story is the part you do the blood is what jesus did and then you hit the story and the story is like a slingshot it's like a rock in your slingshot and it slays the giant and it wasn't really the stone that killed goliath it was the power of god behind it but if he never sent the stone the giant doesn't fall the power of god doesn't back up a stone but when you tell a story god backs up the story and then comes the story stroke and then God strikes it I came to tell you that she looks him dead in his face and she says after all you stole from me after all the years you took from me after all that you've done to me after all you have done to me after how degraded you make me feel after every punch in the face after every year after every bad dream after every embarrassment and after every humiliation my past is caused last night you almost killed me but i'm alive to tell the story i'm alive to tell a story and i've got a story to tell and i'm looking for five people in here who say i should have died but i lived so i'll stand and declare the goodness of god in the land of the living i did not survive all that hell to stay there and so so today I don't know if it's, you can stay on your feet, stay on your feet. I don't know who you are. You got something behind you, you got a navel. 
And you've been trying to divorce him your whole life. You've been trying for years to divorce him. You've been trying to get rid of him for years. He's in your dreams and he's in your heart and he's in your soul and you can't get rid of this thing. I came today by the power vested in me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't know if I'm qualified to perform a marriage, but by the power of the Holy Spirit today, I'm qualified to perform a divorce. And so I came today to pronounce a holy divorce. That's right. That's right. You can come. That's fine. I came to perform a holy divorce to declare in here today that the blood of Jesus is severing you from your past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They come forward for a wedding. They come down to the altar. I think we should turn this kingdom, this, this world, we do things upside down. I'm asking you, if you want a divorce, why don't you come? This is a holy divorce. It's when you finally decide, this is not something I can do on my own. And I don't know how I got here, but I believe I don't have to die here. But it's either Nabal or me. And I came to fight for some people today. I'd come here to look cute. I came here because Nabal almost killed me. I didn't ask to be here. I've been hiding from moments like these my whole life. But as long as I'm here, I'm gonna tell the story that it is possible for Nabal to die. I'm alive to tell the story. You're alive to tell the story. It is for freedom that Christ has made you free. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus for the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. It is for freedom that Christ has made you free. It is for freedom that Christ has made you free. And so right now I'm gonna make a declaration and then you're gonna declare this song with your own mouth as your own declaration. I'm gonna make some declarations right now over you. I declare in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that from this day forward, you will not answer to that name anymore. I break all legal authority and I, re and I revert you back to your maiden name, the name that Jesus called you in your mother's womb. You are legally no longer allowed to call yourself that name. I, today, I dissolve all accounts that are shared and I strip you of any connection you have to Nabal. In Jesus' mighty name, I declare that you are not Nabal. I declare that today there is a wedding taking place in where Nabal is being buried. And David, you are free to move into your future. I declare that you are free to move into your future. That from this moment on, you will stop trying to sign those papers with your own blood. And that you will accept once and for all the finished work of the cross. And from this moment forward, you are not Nabal, you are Abigail, you are who God says you are. You will be who God says you will be. And I want you to declare now from your own mouth, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. Moving ahead, I'm here to declare to you past is over in you all things are made new surrender my life to christ i'm moving not going back I'm moving ahead i'm here to declare past is over in you all things are made new surrender my life to christ Moving, not going, moving ahead, moving ahead. To declare to you, the past is over. All things are new. 
surrender my life to Christ. I'm moving, not going back. I'm moving ahead. Come on, make a prophetic declaration today. My past is over in you. All things are made new. Surrender my life. Come on, one more time with your voice, with your faith. Not going back. I'm moving ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. To you make you. all things new. My past is over in you. All things are made new. Surrender my life. called a divorce party yeah 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 where they actually have a ceremony and they celebrate now in the natural that's crazy to me but I think in the case of a holy divorce I think we might have the liberty right now to have a divorce party and that's what I feel like is happening right now as we say this uh, you make all things new that means I'm celebrating the fact that this is a done deal that I'm moving forward so Transformation Nation, if you know how to have a good party, why don't you get up on your feet for the final 30 seconds here and let's celebrate that there has been a holy divorce. You make all things new. You make all things new. before we leave we need to address you walked in here and you say I don't have any idea what I just walked in on I don't even know this Jesus that you're talking about and today I want to tell you that the Bible says that if you believe in your heart not if you understand everything yet the Bible says if you can just get to this crazy faith part where you hear a crazy story and you feel like I actually believe that story all you have to do is admit it. It says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that that is the wedding ceremony and now you'll hold up your whole life to figure out how to be married to Jesus. But it all begins with one moment. 
And if you don't know this Jesus and you're standing there today and you say, in my heart, something in me, maybe you're watching online and something in you is just saying, I believe, I believe. It's crazy, but I believe. I want to say that that is the Spirit of God. Nobody comes to believe a crazy story like this unless the Holy Spirit draws him. And so today, if you're in this room or if you're online, I want to lead you in a simple prayer that will begin your journey with Jesus. And we're going to say it all with you together because we've all said it before and nobody should have to say it alone. It is the most incredible thing. Repentance sounds so scary. Because it feels like repent, this means God is standing between you and the things you love and, and smacking your hands off of it. But the truth is the things you love are here and God is over here. And repentance is just saying to, to you, you don't have to stay there if you don't want. You don't have to. You can turn around and you come. It is it's just an invitation. You decide, I want you because anytime you get married, you're saying yes to one person and no to everybody else. And salvation is you saying yes to Jesus and no to everything else in this world. Jesus and Jesus alone, if that's you, would you pray this prayer with us and understand that God is listening. This means something to him. It's not just a moment to be skipped over, but heaven is listening right now as you pray. Say, Dear God, I admit I've made mistakes. I admit I need a savior. I ask that you change my heart, that you change my motives. I believe you lived, you died, and rose again just for me. Please change me, renew me, and transform me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we celebrate today? If you made that decision today or in this room or online, you can text SAVED to 828-282 because we would love to get a Bible in your hand and, and give you some resources of now how to live in this new relationship. Well, we love you. Thank you so much for being here. Visit the pub table right outside the arena doors to receive your next steps and we'll also have a gift for you. Prayer rooms are open after service and I'll leave you with this. I want you to do this, ready? Go out and live a transformed life. I love you. Thank you so much for watching this message. We pray that it encouraged you. We also wanna say thank you to our faithful partners and givers here at Transformation Church. It's because of your generosity that this vision has been made possible. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can text GIVE to 828282, or you can visit our website. Also, be sure to like, subscribe, and check out our other sermons, as well as our live Sunday experience that begins at 1045 a.m. Central Standard Time. Now go out and live a transformed life. Thank you.